The other series we're going to talk about today, Logan, is the 4-5 out east. Cavs magic. The Cavs with a little bit of game 82 tanking to uh, get their way into the four seed. And some are wondering if the basketball gods will punish them. We talked about this earlier with the Lakers. I don't know. We'll have to see. What's the first key to you in this series, Logan? The first key to me is can Cleveland pick themselves up off the mat? I mean, dude, we're getting into the... We're getting into the later rounds of a title fight here, man, and they're slumped on the ground, man. We're about to get to the 10 count. Uh, Cleveland has been the worst playoff team post-All-Star break, mm -hmm. a 12-17 and 17 record. Uh, Hoop Venue, a uh, friend of the show, uh, did a show with us a couple uh, a week back, um, tweeted that out, uh, does great stuff. You guys should follow him, uh, Hoop Venue underscore on Twitter. Shout out. Um, Big ups. Go, yeah, shout out. It's not just the team, it's also their stars. Donovan Mitchell over the last 15, 23 and 6 on 40, 33, 89 splits, clearly still hampered. Uh, Darius Garland over his last 15, 16, 3 and 7 on 41, 33, 80 splits. Something we spoke about with Hoop Venue on that show was how Cleveland staggers their minutes come playoff time. Because if you remember during the red hot stretch of the season, they were without a lot of their key star guys. No Mobley, no Garland, and it was basically the Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen show with shooters, and it mm -hmm. worked. I mean, they cooked, man. They were lighting it up offensively. They were clamps defensively. It was the best stretch of their season. Last season, when we saw all four of their stars healthy in the playoffs, they had an offensive rating of 101.9. It was dead last in all of the playoff field, 16 out of 16. Just a ton of lineup redundancy, a complete lack of spacing, and their offense turned to Donovan Mitchell basically just saying, hey, I'm just going to dribble for about eight seconds, and then I'm going to take a sidestep three. I'm either going to hit it or I'm not, and if I hit it, all right, cool. If we don't, we better get back on defense. <laughs> it was a really stagnant, ugly offense, and you could just tell, like, it was frustration. It was, it, you know, it was palpable for Cleveland. And so I think that they need to stagger their guys' minutes I think they need to play Struess, Levert, Merrill heavy minutes. Just give them shooting on the wings, and you got to survive with it, man. You got to hope those guys are hitting uh, their shots. So uh, there's three big keys for me. It's one: how do the stars play? Um, what do Mitchell and Garland look like? It's two: how do they, you know, stagger their lineup? Do we get these staggered rotations where we get two sets of stars, two sets of stars? Or are you closing with all four of them on the court? And then my final key, and this is something that we saw in the Knicks series that really bit Cleveland in the ass, that really surprised me that they didn't address at all during the regular season. Can they survive with just two real centers in their rotation? There is such a massive burden on Evan Mobley and Jared Allen's shoulders to anchor the interior of this defense, which is also why I think maybe they should stagger their rotation. There's not really a third big guy in this rotation. Do you put Dean Wade at the five? You know, are you running Damian Jones minutes? They basically were not running Damian Jones minutes. Yeah, dude. I mean, you're playing 40 minutes of Allen and Mobley. Like, they just were tired. You know, the Knicks just had more guys to turn to. And I wonder against a big physical athletic team with, you know, with the Wagners, with Wendell Carter Jr., with Paolo Bancaro, with, you know, I don't know, you could throw in Goga Batadze off the bench. They just got big guys that are going to be fresh. I wonder if Mobley and Allen are going to be fresh at the end of this series. They were just dogged and tired, man, and they don't have a whole lot of five depth. So I worry about them. Um, those are just the big – that's the big key for me, man. What the hell does Cleveland look like, and can they correct course? They have by far looked like the worst playoff team in the field uh, post-All-Star break. And uh, they just got to pick themselves up off the mat, man. And I really worry – if Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland aren't at a hundred percent, I mean, can they even generate a one hundred offensive rating? Like, how ugly and how bad does their offense look if those guys aren't, uh, you know, at the peak of their powers? And this is a tough defense to go up against, man. Orlando's been as good defensively as anybody not named Minnesota this whole year. And you're right, nobody in the playoff field has been worse than the Cavs post All Star game. They've been a disaster, but. A vast majority of that has been without Donovan Mitchell. And uh, Donovan Mitchell really hadn't looked anything like himself until these last couple games. He had missed 
15 of the previous 21, I believe, with that knee injury. The six he had played in, he was giving you 14 points per game on 47% true shooting. But these last two games, to me, have been encouraging. His pull-up jumper's been falling, which has been one thing, but also just, like, he's looked twitchy, he's looked quick, he's looked comfortable, he's been assertive. It's like, okay, this is a Donovan Mitchell who I can buy into going in the playoffs, whereas, based on what we had seen up to that point, I was like, I don't know, man. I still can't confidently say that he's at 100%, but he looks like a star, at least, whereas previously it was like, this guy shouldn't really be on the court right now. And when he plays, the Cavs are 36-19. and 19. They have been a damn good basketball team. That's like, what, a 54-win pace? And this series, to me, is just going to be about who the hell can create consistent shots. Because we are in for a dog fight, bro. We are in for a rock fight. We are in for a throwback. Like Cavs Knicks last year, right? This is a series where you're going to produce some offensive ratings in the low 100s. And this is the one guy who is of the caliber where I think he can consistently get you good shots. He can create penetration. He's a good playmaker and has had a career season there. Also, just as a sidebar, one of the 10 sexiest passers in the league. Like, if I was ranking my sexiest passers, bro, obviously you have to have Jokic and Luka and LeBron and Trey, but Donovan Mitchell is pretty far up there, dude. Just like the the one-handed live dribble passes that he whips at 50 miles an hour. He threw a pocket pass with such beautiful spin on it, fired a behind-the-back pass on the money to a shooter like two possessions later. He's just a sexy passer, man. He may not be the best, but he's one of the sexiest, and uh, I believe in him. And I, I believe in him as by far the best offensive player in the series. Garland also at this point, it's like, can kind of only be better than he has been. Like, I don't think Darius Garland can be any worse. And I do think their willingness to tinker with lineups is a key. You hit on a great point. And it's something that Tyler from Hoop Venue brought up when we had him on. The Cavs net rating this year with their big four, Mitchell, Garland, Mobley, Allen, is just plus two. Like, it's really not very impressive because you're just not getting the most diverse skill sets. And so I do think you need to be willing to, at times, close with, like, Mitchell, Okoro, Struess. If he's healthy, Dean Wade, hopefully he's healthy because I think Dean Wade kind of actually matters. Like, he's just a good rotation player. And Jared Allen. And then you're super switchable. You have reliable shooting. And you have the one lethal on-ball creator and the one elite Rim protecting big. That's how the Cavs have looked their best this year. They're still the more talented team, and they still have like the more proven formula. So they uh should win this series, but they have looked really bad as of late. And on the flip side, Orlando has an emerging weapon who has become more and more available and more and more of a factor in Jonathan Isaac. And if he can play 30 minutes a game in this series, which, I mean, he's been knocking on the door these last couple games, the Magic are a plus 12 net rating team when he plays. They outscore opposing teams by 12 points per 100 possessions. That's equivalent to being the best team in the league. They have a defensive rating of 105.6 with him out there. That would comfortably be the best in the league. He gives you over 10 rebounds and four and a half stocks per 36 and just blows games up man with his secondary rim protection he is massive he is a freak athlete he is long as hell he is a problem on switches so he presents a defensive ceiling that uh this team's raw defensive rating doesn't even reflect because if he's out there consistently like he's their best defender all due respect to all defense Jalen Suggs he is a different kind of game breaker 100 percent, dude I wrote down that exact same stat uh courtesy of cleaning the glass, Jonathan Isaac is a huge X factor to me. And that's why I say, you know, if we don't get Mitchell or Garland at the peak of their powers, I think one, just again, like you said, dude, Orlando is such a dogged defense where I think they can turn this into a nasty, disgusting game and then a uh, nasty, disgusting series. And then I think that Orlando has... I think I like their depth more in terms of offensive creation. I think they've got more guys, maybe not high-end like Mitchell or Garland, but I think they got more guys who can generate and find their shot. Um, if it's Paolo, if it's Franz, if it's Mo Wagner, you know, if it's Wendell Carter, like I just think they have more offensively skilled guys um, that they're going to play. It's an interesting series because earlier in the year when Cleveland was clicking a little more, it's kind of staggering, Carson. Uh, 
this courtesy of NBA.com, uh, they outscored Orlando by nearly 15 points per game uh, just on threes uh, mm. in the regular season. I mean, that's a huge difference. And yeah. you talk about reliably generating offense. I may like Orlando's crop of stars. They didn't show it. In the regular season matchups, Orlando shot an effective field goal percentage under 50% on shots outside of the paint. That's 28th in the league. I mean, it was just ugly. So, I mean, dude, we are in for the rock fight of all rock fights in this yeah. series, and I'm all for it. I know I know a lot of people don't like defensive, nasty, grimy games. I'm all for it, man. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um it's just such a it's such an unpredictable series. You know what I mean? It's there's so many different variables that come into play here. Uh and I lean on the team that has more size, that has more athleticism, and that has the higher defensive ceiling, in my opinion. And so and if we get if Donovan Mitchell it. if Donovan Mitchell plays like Donovan Mitchell, I would take Cleveland. But I just don't know if I can anticipate that. And so I think wow. I'm going to lean. I think I'm going to take Orlando in seven. Wow. Here's why I disagree. I have so many concerns about Orlando's offense. Number one, is Paolo ready to be a legit number one in a playoff series and do so in an offensive situation that is not ideal against still one of the best defenses in the field? Like, he has been... One of the least efficient volume scores in basketball this year, under 55% true shooting. I made a whole video about the good and the bad with him just a few weeks back, but shot selection is still a major issue, and spacing is a factor in that, but at the end of the day, he just takes too many tough mid-range pull-up jumpers. He settles too much, and he's not good at those shots. He's 39% inside the paint, outside the restricted area. He's 40% for mid-range. He has a tendency to turn his back to the basket on drives. He has a tendency to settle for these tough turnarounds when he has physical advantages. There was a game just last week. I, I forget who they were playing, but he had some guard switched on to him. I was watching with my friend, and I said, he's going to shoot a tough turnaround here. And sure enough, that's what he did. Like, he has just not optimized his efficiency and he is not mature to the basketball player that he's capable of being. Of course he hasn't, because he's in this second year. But people see Paolo and they go, oh my god, look at these traits. Ooh, he's got a little bit of a LeBron movement style to him. And his playmaking is so advanced for his age. And he has these moments of tough shot making. And they want to say, like, he is the guy right now who we are projecting him to be. But he's still a young guy, super inefficient, super inconsistent as a shot maker. And the Cavs are really really well built to guard him he had one awesome game against them where he was getting a step and he was also just like putting on a show in terms of difficult shot making but he mostly struggled across the other three matchups and i think that they have a number of good options to guard him jared allen to me is a really good primary option in the first matchup paolo was beating him a little bit with foot speed but then from that point forward allen just started kind of playing further off him and paolo's really not that quick in the half court in terms of just first step where he wins as a driver more often is with his physicality and allen guards well in space for a big and you are not going through him like he is super super strong and then outside of him Mobley still brings great size and length and Paolo's tendency is just to settle and so uh, Mobley affects those shots. Dean Wade if he's healthy has the exact kind of build right a strong big wing moves well in space. Okoro a little bit shorter but athletic low center of gravity defensive dog even Nyang and Struess you would never want to like be the matchup for Paolo but off a of switch, like those guys are stout. They're not easily moved off their spots. And that's kind of what Paolo has to do to be most effective. So I think it's a tough matchup for a guy who hasn't proven that he's at the place where it's like, yeah, that guy can be your number one in a playoff series and you can win it. And then you look to Franz and it's like, can he step up? Can he be your best offensive player? And it's possible. But first of all, we know Paolo is going to have the keys in terms of usage. He's just going to be the highest priority. And Franz's shot just hasn't fallen all year. He's been like consistently around 28% from deep. And the Cavs are really well built to guard him too. Like for a team that is lacking in perimeter shooting, that is going to try to create penetration and do so with like two uh, big wings who are not necessarily the quickest, 
this team with a collection of versatile bigs and big wings, stout wings, it's just like they're built in a lab to guard the Magic. And I think Okoro is probably going to be the primary matchup for Franz. That's tough to me. And outside of that, I, I just don't think they have enough shot making. Like, scoring in the paint is going to be tough against the Cavs. And they are going to play those gaps aggressively on Paolo and Franz drives and make their lives hard. And they're going to force you to beat them with your spot-up shooting. And I just don't think Orlando is proven enough there. And really, the only defensive weakness for Cleveland is at the point of attack with their small guards. And can any magic guard produce enough offense for that to matter? Who? Cole Anthony? Well, I mean, I think Anthony and Fultz provide an interesting challenge um, just in terms of I think they can, you know, I think they can get the defense in rotation a little bit. I, I do think shooting variants is a big swing factor in this series. And there is a chance where if Orlando falls asleep enough during a game and concedes enough shots that – Cleveland could just outshoot them from behind the arc. But here's my thing. I think if Cleveland gets this thing done early, four or five games, I think it favors them, like where if they're red hot shooting. But if this series goes long, I just think Allen and Mobley are going to be worn out at the end of this series, man. I know there's more time between games because it's the first round. I'm just really concerned about them holding up over a long series trying to play 40 minutes a night versus Orlando bigs that are just going to be fresher. And I am leaning more on, I would lean more on Fultz. I'd lean more on Anthony. And I'd lean on I those guys about trying to... I playing Markel Fultz in this series, man. Shit is going to get clogged up if you're playing Markel Fultz in this series. Hey, I'm just man, talking it's... about in terms of those those guys trying to create penetration at the point of attack against Garland and Mitchell, those would be the guys that I'm attacking defensively. And Struess, like, I don't know, man. I, I'm i just wondering, like, do you really think there's that big of a gap between Cleveland and Orlando's offense? Absolutely. When Donovan Mitchell is himself, absolutely, dude. I think you're underselling, like, how uniquely bad a playoff offense Orlando is. They're 22nd in offensive rating. Only two teams in the last decade have won a playoff series ranking that low. I, I'm not, well, I'm not underselling that. I just think that Orlando also really matches up well against Cleveland's offense. Like, Suggs at the point of attack. I think both all teams of those are built big... to guard each other well, for sure. But then give me by far the best shot creator and shot maker on the floor in Donovan Mitchell. Darius Garland has had a down year, but he absolutely could be the second best offensive player in this series. Cleveland does have more perimeter shooting, period, point blank. Orlando's last in threes made. They're toward the bottom in three-point percentage. And again, I worry about Fultz being the guy who you're like, okay, he's going to create our advantages because then, then you have Paolo and Franz who have really struggled to spot up shooters off ball or... You have those guys with the ball in their hands and Fultz, who is a terrible spot-up shooter off ball alongside them. Suggs just isn't going to take that initiative as a creator, and you need him out on the floor for his spot-up shooting and his point-of-attack defense. I just don't think this Orlando team is there yet. Like, Cleveland has been playing bad basketball, but the ceiling they have shown is in a different stratosphere. And there is a threshold at which it's like, okay, you're so good defensively, and you're good enough offensively where I think you can grind these series out. Orlando's not there and it's not because Cleveland's offense is super pretty it's not because they're one of the better playoff offenses in this field at all but they certainly have higher highs there and they have more talent at the end of the day and that's just what I'm going to bet on I, I worry about Orlando just having ugly ugly games offensively I think this whole series is going to be really ugly man um I'm going to take the bigger, more physical team, and I just think Orlando has more quality basketball players that I like, man. I'm I'm going to take Orlando in seven. All right, Cleveland's pretty big, man. Cleveland's pretty freaking big, too. I'm going to take the Cavs in six. Uh, I think these are both elite defenses, but ultimately, in these ugly, grinded-out environments, you got to have that guy who can just get his shot in a series like this. And... Uh, Paolo, I just don't think is at that level yet. I think he's going to take a lot of tough shots. I think he's going to miss a lot of tough shots. I think he's going to make a lot of good decisions as a passer, but I'm not sure that uh, Orlando has the shooting necessary to like consistently hold Cleveland accountable, and uh, he still takes too many tough shots. So we will disagree on that one. We agree on Mavs Clippers. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? I'm just really excited uh, for Cavs Magic. I think it's going to be like such a uniquely grimy series. I think it's just going to be a lot of fun. 
Oh, it's going to be grimy. It's going to be dirty. And you're going to like it, pal. That's exactly <laughs> your speed.